Today is Thursday, September 30, 2021. Roland Martin on the filter, coming live to you from Dallas, Texas, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Senator Tim Scott, he insists that he did the right thing in killing the Georgia Floyd Justice Act, blaming it on Democrats. Two more law enforcement groups, separate from the other two, now say that they side with Scott. But what's really going on here? A breakdown of the bill. Is it true or not that Democrats wanted to so-called defund the police? I have gone through it. I can't find the evidence that Scott's talking about. We're going to hear from Michael Harriet of The Root, where he breaks down uh, how Scott has changed course when it comes to police reform. We'll also talk to Reddit Hudson about police accountability and this bill as well. It's a conversation y'all do not want to miss as we dig deeper in who is telling the truth about the George Floyd Justice Act. Also, in California, the DA moved to scrap 60,000 marijuana cases. We'll tell you about that. California Governor Gavin Newsom has authorized the return of black property on a beach that was uh, stolen from African Americans who were run off of that beach uh, decades ago. Uh, also uh, on uh, today's show, Tennessee State Senator convicted uh, in a uh, tax case, four out of five charges. We'll hear from her and her attorneys uh, on today's show uh, as well. And also some sad news. One of the sisters we told you about who was missing this week, found dead in Houston. Folks, it's a jam-packed show. It's time to bring the funk. Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. 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 All right, folks, we've been doing a deep dive into the failure of the George Floyd Justice Act in the United States Senate. It has pitted uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, Republican, against Democrat Senator Cory Booker. Now, we have been breaking down for you exactly where Senator Scott has stood on this issue. He has said that uh, he uh, did not move forward on the bill because Democrats wanted to defund the police. He insists in the bill that there are several clauses that show where they wanted to take money from law enforcement. His position, they must keep giving money. On Tuesday, two police organizations came out publicly stating that there was nothing in the proposed legislation that defunded police. One of them was the Fraternal Order Police. Senator Scott's office sent me an email today showing other uh, law enforcement groups who take the opposite position. All right, so we're gonna, re we're gonna read for you uh, exactly uh, what those are. So let's, so, let's, so let's actually go through that. So, so uh, th this was a particular statement uh, that, that, that came from one of those groups. I wanna read from that, that please. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull that graphic up uh, so you can actually see uh, th this graphic. And so uh, one of these, again, one of these organizations, and like I say, what you have is you gotta understand there's not one law enforcement organization. There are different law enforcement groups. And so that's what Scott's office is banking on. And so they're saying, yeah, the sheriff's, uh, the sheriff's uh, organization, that they uh, are uh, in opposition to the bill. But again, you have two other groups that are in support of the bill. Yeah, I know uh, it sounds uh, real confusing, folks, because... It is confusing uh, and to understand exactly uh, what is going on. And so 
Um, here, here's what you have here, okay, uh, with this particular sheriff's organization, all right, which is SCSA, uh, and that, you know, that's, that's what they actually go by. Now, that is the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. Now, here's what's interesting, all right. It's the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. There are 49 other states. But again, Scott is banking on them. And so this is what they wrote. Uh, they, 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 they were particularly disappointed to learn of the deterioration of uh, negotiations on national police reform. Now, they wrote, various media outlets have attempted to determine who is at fault for the uh, class of bipartisan discussions. Some have cited support or criticism from various national law enforcement organizations. In fact, some have gone uh, so far to allege Senator Tim Scott and his staff operated in bad faith and against the whole uh, the, uh, uh, against uh, the wishes of police groups. So this person, as someone who literally sat at the negotiation table with Senator Scott Graham and Booker, I want to clarify a few matters. You know, so again, this is coming from the president of the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. All right, uh, who was last name is Tolson. All right, so he, here's what he lays out in here. He lays out in here that. OK, blah, blah, blah. I have great respect, admiration, yada, yada, yada uh, for these other organizations. Uh, but he says uh, he goes on to say honest communication, we can't understand each other's concerns and objectives, yada, 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 yada. He said, second, while I never saw a legislative draft that contained the words defunding the police, that does not mean provisions in these drafts would not cause law enforcement to lose funding. Several drafts contain provisions that prohibited states or local units of government from being eligible for COPS or Burns JAG grants unless certain statutes were enacted. Making critical funding for agencies in the executive branch contingent upon the enactment of statutes by the legislative branch, in my opinion, is wrong. Had these provisions been enacted, law enforcement agencies nationwide likely would have lost important federal funding because their state legislatures either would not or could not comply with the federal requirements. This is de facto defunding the police. Okay, let me unpack why that is a lie. Now, first, I want you to leave the statement up. Leave the statement up. Leave the statement up because I need you to under I need you to understand. I need you to see for your own words because I need you to realize. We showed you the video where a year ago, Senator Tim Scott said that if folks did not, well, they not, were not in compliance, they could not get the grants. He said that in the executive order that Donald Trump signed that Senator Tim Scott supported, it said the same thing. So... All of a sudden, why is there a difference? What, what's going on here that they are asserting that, oh, if you don't do these things, you can't get the money? Senator Tim Scott actually said it. If y'all had the soundbite when he was on with uh, Judy Woodruff from PBS, he said it. Listen. We're saying these things should be tied to federal funding, that if departments go ahead with them, they risk losing funding. And yet yes. you also said today that this is something that should be debated. The choke call should be debated for the American people to hear. So it sounds like you're open to a complete ban on a choke hold. Is that right? Well, I would say, th say it this way. Um, my legislation gets us to the position where if you are in a, a law enforcement department that does not already have a ban on choke holds, you do not have uh, access to the federal funding. The, the House bill does not have the ability to actually, in my opinion, ban chokeholds. What they do is they defund states' revenue streams from the federal government. It's kind of the same thing, to be honest with you. The fact of the matter is that policing is a local government decision, not a federal decision. So I'd love to see how the Democrats thread that needle from federalism uh, and the local department's ability to make the decisions. We do that through the re re refusing to give them the, the, the grant dollars. The White House and their executive order does the exact same thing through a certification process. So all three levers of government 
have the same objective. I think we get there if we keep working together, looking for some. Okay, he literally said, we do that in the executive order. Well, Tim Scott, what the hell is the difference? That's what the federal government does. The federal government in numerous bills that I guarantee you he's voted for, tell states, if you do not do these things, you can't get the federal funding. That's the only way the federal folks are able to make changes. I told y'all before, when the highway, federal highway funding, they want to increase the drinking age, the legal drinking age in America from 18 to 21. The federal government said to South Carolina, to the other 49 states, if you want to qualify for federal highway funds, you will only get the money if you raise your minimum drinking age to 21. That's a fact. So he now all of a sudden, oh, I disagree with that uh, from a state level. I'm sorry, y'all, that, that dog just not gonna hunt. And so he's saying, oh, these, you know, policing, it's a, it's a local thing. And this is a problem. He's saying it's a local thing, but well, why in the hell are we even discussing a federal bill then? See, you can't have it both ways, Senator Tim Scott. You can't say it's a local thing, but then you're leading, leading this federal bill. And, and, and you ought to see, and, and look, here are all of these statements that Senator Tim Scott has made uh, about uh, the, about this this particular bill. I mean, he, he said all kind of stuff. He said change requires resources. Sadly, the Democrats' proposal contained multiple measures that would have diminished funding for law enforcement. No, it wouldn't diminish it. It simply says, if you do not do these things, you don't get the federal funds. That ain't cutting funding. That's simply saying, you want the money? You got to do some stuff. Scott says, we all agree only the best should wear the badge. If we want to protect vulnerable communities, we have to provide the resources needed to train and retain the best. Yeah, but you also got to make changes to how they actually do it. I grew up in some very poor communities, always wondering if my mother would make it into the house safely after her late shifts. Folks in those communities deserve better, and I'll continue working until they see solutions. Really? Then he goes on. Under GOP leadership, we saw solutions. Permanent funding for HBCUs, that is a lie. That is a lie, Senator, uh, Senator Scott. You did not do permanent funding for HBCUs. In fact, you could say under GOP leadership, it wasn't even a GOP bill. That was led by Congresswoman Alma Adams, Democrat from North Carolina, HBCU graduate. Please don't lie. Record low unemployment rates. At a point, they were record low unemployment rates. Then they double when COVID hit. So please stop it. A fair justice system. Stop lying, Senator Tim Scott. Democrats controlled the House. Criminal justice reform bill. The first step act was passed by a Democratic House. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries led it. That bill was strengthened in the United States Senate when Senator Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris, and Senator Dick Durbin, including Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, said that bill did not go far enough and it was strengthened. Please stop trying to claim credit under GOP leadership. No, that is simply false. If it were not for the Democrats insisting on changes being made, you would not have had the First Step Act. Stop taking credit for things you didn't do. He goes, if the Democrats really want solutions now, they should come back to the negotiating table. No, how about you be honest about actually what's going on? Now I told you these, these statements, all these people releasing these various statements uh, uh, about, um, about this particular bill. And I told you uh, there was a sheriff's association that also uh, what was taking a, a different position, all right? And so here's what I find to be interesting. And again, Senator Tim Scott's office sent me an email, okay? You have two groups, Major County Shares of America 
And then you have National Association of Police Organizations. All right. The major county sheriff's association of America, they sent out their statement. And so that's the problem. What you have is you have different folks, different groups on the aisles. And so this is what they said, the, the MCSA. Legislative proposals could diminish policing resources in many ways without specifically defunding programs. What the hell? You can't have it both ways. The net effect of one proposal that Senator Scott opposed was that fewer resources would be available to departments that would be unlikely to be able to immediately comply with the many new regulations. Hey, y'all, that's what happens. We support and encourage legislation. Y'all, if y'all want to hear a contradiction, listen to this. We support and encourage legislation that leads to better policing and more safety for communities. However, Legislation that adds more regulations while threatening existing funding levels is setting up our law enforcement agencies for failure. No, it's not. Stop lying. You cannot complain about more regulations and you want the money. Carrot, stick carrot on a stick, carrot, stick, stick carrot. If you want more money, Federal folks are saying you got to do these things to get more money. So what Senator Tim Scott wants to do is just say, hey, I'm just going to give y'all more money. No, you have got to comply. You have got to make changes to how you behave, how your officers behave. The problem is they don't want the level of accountability that Democrats have been calling for. That is the fundamental problem here. So, y'all, I've gone through the bill, and the stuff Senator Tim Scott sent me about, oh, it would defund, no. What the Democrats were saying is, if y'all want to get this extra money, you've got to do some things to qualify for it. This, it is no different than the, than the executive order that Trump signed. You want to get the money, you got to be certified. you got an option. Don't get certified, don't get the money. No one is forcing. See, this is the thing that Sarah and Tim Scott and his team, they're not admitting to. No one is forcing any law enforcement agency to do anything. What they're saying is, if you want more money, this is what you got to do. Hell, that's like my mom and daddy saying, huh, so you want me to fund your trip? Well, I'm going to let you do some shit around the house. That's like me saying, no, I ain't going to do extra stuff around the house. I want the money. And my parents are like, well, hell, I ain't giving you the money. Y'all, this is not hard. But the problem is law enforcement and Senator Tim Scott want it both ways. They do not want to force these law enforcement people to make changes. And then Scott's talking about federalism and this is all local. Guess what? That's fine. But see, see. Here's my other problem right here, Senator Tim Scott. You of all people got to stop this nonsense about federalism and states' rights when your state gets damn near half of its budget from the federal government. It's amazing how y'all don't like federalism until you need a check. The federal government right now sets conditions on housing grants, environmental grants, transportation grants, up and down the board. But all of a sudden, Sir and Tim Scott, no, 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 no. We can't have that when it comes to policing. No, sorry, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it because it's nonsense. They don't want the accountability, folks. That's what they don't want. I want to bring in several people. Reddit Hudson, he's the founder of the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers for Justice, Reform, and Accountability. We have Cheryl Dorsey, retired Los Angeles Police Department Sergeant. We have Michael Harriet, senior writer for The Root. He's out of Birmingham. Cheryl also is the author of the book Confidence Chronicles, The Confidence Chronicles, The Greatest Crime Story Never Told Out of Los Angeles. Reddit, I'm going to start with you. Go to Cheryl. Go to Michael. Reddit, I've walked through the bill. 
I've talked to Congresswoman Karen Bass. I've been texting Senator Tim Scott. I've been emailing his office. We've been sitting, we've been trying to get Senator Cory Booker on. I have not talked to him. We've talked to his staff. Senator Booker, I need you to come talk to black America, please. If you have, if you have found time to go and meet the press and Jake Tapper on CNN and, uh, and other shows, you can come do black media. Okay. So that needs to be said. Was a trip here, Reddit, is the game that Senator Tim Scott is playing by touting the sheriff's organization and this South Carolina sheriff's group, okay? And then you have the Fraternal Order of Police, which is considered the major police organization. And another one that said what he's saying is not it. Your assessment of what's going on here when it comes to the George Floyd Justice Act. Well, you hit the nail on the head already, Roland. Uh, Senator Scott is responding to his handlers. He's doing what his handlers want him to do. I read an excellent article by the brother that's on the panel with us today, Michael Harriet, who uh, pointed out that Senator Scott started back in 2015 uh, introducing a bill that called for exactly what you said, federal withholding of funds for states that didn't comply with the guidelines of the bill that he set forth. He is on the side of those folks. Uh, again, those people he represents and those law enforcement agencies are never, ever going to vote for accountability, support accountability for enforcement agencies that violate, you know, uh, our rights, our constitutional rights, our human rights, our civil liberties. They're never going to do that. They're going to stall, bullshit, and, and, and shuffle all the way until Democrats do what they need to do, either get rid of the filibuster and cram some of these things down the throats of aggressive, open opposition or not. But Tim Scott is going to be Tim Scott. I don't think any of us are surprised by his performance. Cheryl, again, I have taken a lot of time to walk through this. I've gone through... Um, these particular statements. I've gone through um, what folks have said. I've listened to what Scott said on Face the Nation. I listened to what Booker said. I've, I've spent the time going through it. I sat here and read the statement from the National Fraternal Order of Police, as well as the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Okay. Now, I, I'm not in law enforcement, but frankly, if we're talking about who are the major police organizations is really the Air National Association of the Chiefs of Police and Fraternal Order of Police. But Scott is using the, what these sheriff's folks uh, are saying, when if we really want to be honest, the biggest problem in this country with policing is coming from the jurisdictions covered by the FOP as well as the IACP. So here's the deal. There's a lot of double talk and a lot of code speak, and we understand that there are 18,000 police departments across these United States, and all of them have unions of one sort or another. So to cherry pick one, South Carolina's police union, and tout what they have to say as somehow having more sway and meaning is really being disingenuous. This was never going to pass in the first place. Tim Scott made it perfectly clear in the very beginning when he said, Qualified immunity is going to be a non-starter in any negotiation. That means having officers be held accountable, having officers be able to be charged when they violate policy, when they commit murder, when they use deadly force as a first resort rather than a last resort. Qualified immunity would stop all of that if it were removed out of the police officer's Bill of Rights. They do not want that. And Tim Scott knows that. Also, in this George Floyd Justice and Reform Act, I've got so many issues with it, because a lot of what they talk about deals with federal funding not being given, as you said, if they don't do certain things or if they do certain things, like no-knock warrants. It only applies to federal no-knock warrants. When was the last time Anybody saw a federal officer serve a doggone search warrant for narcotics. 
Breonna Taylor wasn't killed by federal officers. She was killed by state officers. And so all of this talk about no-knock warrants and banning chokeholds versus other departments who continue to use the chokehold, again, would only affect if it's a federal agency, not local and state police, because police chiefs have tremendous autonomy, and they will continue to do exactly what it is that they have been doing, which is sheltering errant officers. All of them are being intellectually dishonest in their assertions that somehow this is about money. This is about police accountability. Be clear. Uh, Michael, you have a piece uh, in The Root uh, in, with the headline, In Loving Memory of Tim Scott. Uh, you say this uh, in uh, the piece. You said, you said, um, but, but, but before his untimely death, and first of all, obviously he hasn't died, but I know we know what you're talking about. You said, Scott also believed in police reform. He didn't just believe in it. He actually tried to do something about it. He tried before Derek Chauvin kneeled on George Floyd's neck. He tried before Louisville, Kentucky police officers lied on an affidavit to obtain a no-knock warrant for Breonna Taylor's home. Before Ahmaud Arbery, before white people pretended to care about black people for one brief summer, Tim Scott cared about black people. Unpack for the folks watching and listening how Tim, Sc Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott today is totally different I'm the Senator Tim Scott from a few years ago. Yeah. So I think you pack, unpacked a lot of it, uh, Roland, in your open. But w one thing I, I kind of disagree with is, like, we think Tim Scott, we're saying Tim Scott doesn't want police reform. It's clear, like, Tim Scott has been... Like, Tim Scott came up with the idea. If he calls this dis defunding the police... He came up with this idea back in 2015 when Walter Scott was shot and killed by a North Charleston police officer. And Tim Scott, since then, has been trying to introduce the Walter Scott Notification Act, which would create a database of police misconduct and use of lethal force, right? So Tim Scott believes in this. Tim Scott sold himself out. He knows his party doesn't believe in this. And they sent the black dude out there to take the heat because uh, he's Tim Scott. He's the black Republican, right? But since 2015, Tim Scott has been trying to get some of these reforms. And, and as, as we talked about uh, qualified immunity and no-knock uh, no warrants and chokehold bans, that the mechanism... This, this is what Tim Scott's office told me, right? This is not what I think. I taught... He... I talked to Tim Scott, and he got his chief of staff to walk me through the initial version of the bill. And they called the withholding of funds, this is their quote, a complicated strategy to enact, enforce the reforms that we want, right? So if Tim Scott is complaining about this stuff, it is, he's complaining about the stuff that Tim Scott came up with. And that's important to know because... When we talk about these police unions, we have to, first of all, realize that the Fraternal Order of Police uh, oversees and, and represents more than half of the police officers in the country. And then we have to really know that there is this subtle, this little-known white supremacist movement uh, called the, the, the Sovereign Sheriff's Movement that believes, based on this interpretation of a, a white supremacist manifesto from the 1600s, that the sheriffs have the ultimate authority in America. That's who was... That was one of the groups that started the, cap, the riots at the Capitol. That was one of the groups that they were feared would raise, rise up if Donald Trump wasn't re-elected. And this sheriff's group is... That's why these sheriff groups are backing Tim Scott, because it's about white supremacy. It is not about policing, right? If you look back when uh, Senator Je uh, Jeff Sessions went and talked to them and told them that they are the backbone of the Anglo-Saxon law enforcement in America, this is what this is all about. So we have to know that Tim Scott is not arguing against Democrats. Tim Scott is ultimately arguing against what Tim Scott created. I mean, Reddit, here's what, here's what Michael mm -hmm. wrote that is just hilarious. He says, more than a year ago, Scott's own deputy chief of staff, Alyssa Lee Richardson, told The Root 
that reducing funding to police departments was a, quote, complicated mechanism that we had to create to hold every agency accountable. In the bill, under compliance, it says ineligibility for funds for any fiscal year beginning after the date of enactment of this act, a state that fails to comply with subsection A shall be subject to a 10% reduction of the funds that will otherwise be allocated for that fiscal year to the state. What the hell is the difference between that and what Democrats have in the bill? I don't think there is a, a, a difference or a distinction between the two. Uh, it amounts to defunding. If you don't comply with what's laid out for you to comply with, you get defunded. But, you know, to, to Michael's point, with Tim Scott... No, 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 I gotta stop you. No, I gotta stop you. No. Go ahead, go ahead. You're not, def def you're not defunded. No, defunded means you don't get no... This is what defunded means. Defunded means my mom and daddy... My mom and daddy paying my rent. I act the ass. They say, I'm stop paying your rent. That's defunded. Now, if mom and daddy say, I must pull back 10% of, of your rent, hell, they still paying 90. So I ain't defunded. Defunded to me means we taking all your money. This is a 10% reduction. That means well, you're going to get 90. It was, it was legislation that moved in the direction of defunding. But ultimately, what you have, man, is, is Tim Scott needing to make a stand in the aftermath of all the tragedies we've seen in the history, the entire history of policing in this country and its roots and foundation in white supremacy. Here is an opportunity for a black man in the Senate to stand up for his people, and then we just don't see it happening. And I would go further. Uh, as much work has been put into this federal bill. And to Cheryl's point, it is just a federal bill, although the utility of that is always as a model for those states that can be pushed in the direction of reform. I would just like to see a more aggressive posture from every black elected official up there in terms of leveraging the power that they do have. You know, if the Congressional Black Caucus, for example, me and my colleagues talk about this all the time, threw out some ultimatums. They are a significant percentage of uh, the voting body of Congress, if they collectively as a body said, you know what, if we don't get what the hell we want in this bill and we don't get, you know, uh, what we need and what we're asking for, you won't get anything else on your side. We will let the whole thing, just like, this is what the Republicans do. They, we will burn this whole shit down if, if you all don't meet us halfway. And they keep pulling a weaker, less aggressive party away from the will of the majority of people in this country, we all want to see a remade uh, criminal justice system, not just reform. I think this whole system needs to be remade. But we will get nowhere near that with people like Tim Scott and others in positions of leadership who don't have the will to exercise the power that they have. I still say, uh, based on other situations that I've seen Tim Scott operate in, separate and apart from police issues, the brother just looks like he, he's got handlers to me. I don't know him as well as you do. Michael, here's the deal for me, Cheryl. That's what I see. Here's my, here's my deal, Cheryl. Okay, Senator Tim Scott, why don't you, before you talk, talk about what Dems should do, why don't you, Senator Tim Scott, put all the law enforcement groups in a room and say, I need y'all to agree on what all y'all going to support before we move forward. Because, see, this whole deal, most support, oh, the shares disagree, so therefore I ain't moving forward. No, that's called you in search of excuse, Cheryl. Well, this is just a way to muddy up the waters and confuse people who aren't really paying attention and who aren't savvy. But like mm -hmm. I said at the very beginning, at the end of the day, this is about police accountability. That's what this Justice and Reform Bill Act was all about. That was supposedly the purpose behind it. And we know that uh, politicians who look like me, skin folk, <laughs> are, are not interested and don't have the appetite, as Reddit said, to do the right thing. Even Clyburn, Majority Whip Clyburn, was talking in the very beginning about, well, this is a good bill, you know, and I think we should pass it, even though it has no teeth, even though it doesn't do anything to deter bad behavior, to stop officers from killing black folks at will. He said, well, it's a good bill. I mean, it's not perfect, so let's just go ahead and take this good bill. 
not having qualified immunity on the table until we can talk about a better, more perfect bill. That will never happen because, by and large, police administrators, police unions, FOP, whatever you want to call them, do not want their officers to be held accountable. Scott said, well, we won't hold the officers accountable, but maybe we might include the agency being held accountable. If you do that, what have you taught that officer? We have in the example of Derek Chauvin, 18 personnel complaints. He hadn't learned nothing because he hadn't been held accountable. And so this is problematic for me. And M Michael, here's what I don't understand. I, first of all, I cannot stand weak responses. How in the hell Senator Cory Booker and the Democrats just didn't quote what you what you put together? They had to know that beforehand. The, the moment Senator Cory Booker got asked, he should have said, well, I would really like for Senator Tim Scott to please go find and discover the old Senator Tim Scott and then quote this. See, they, 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 they allowed Senator Tim Scott to go and face the nation, say all this sort of stuff, uh, establish and control the narrative without saying Senator Tim Scott himself previously supported cutting funds for states that did not comply. Right. They should have, first of all, they should have, you know, when they started negotiations, they should have started with the point that we have to see how many black people the Republicans are going to let the police kill, right? That should have started the negotiations. And at every point, right, they should have said, we are taking the Republican ideas. We're taking this Tim Scott idea, right? This Because they knew, they should have known from the history of the Republican Party that the Republicans would try to twist this, I, whatever they tried to do, into something that was bad, something that was defunding the police. But, again, I can't understand why no Democrat has come forward now and said, hey, that whole stuff that he's talking about defunding, that was his idea. He came up with that. Like, we agree with it, because it's a pretty good idea, if you think about it, but it came from Tim Scott. So if Tim, if, if that is reducing funds by 10 percent or 20 percent is defunding police, then Tim Scott came up with the idea for defunding to the police. So everybody give him a hand. And that's what they should be doing. That's how they should be messaging, messaging it. But the, the, the more important part is that Almost all of these things that we've discussed, right, about, uh, you know, the, the, the legislation, about the rules that should be given out for the grants, none of that is legislated. Like, the DOJ, which is an executive-level department, we could just change how those things, those the, the, the money is given out. President Biden could do that. The DOJ could do that. The attorney general could do that. And so, if like we're going through all these complicated mechanisms, when the Democratic Party, if 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 Joe Biden had the impetus and the will, he could do it on his own for most of these things, right? There's right. really qualified immunity is the only thing that he really couldn't touch, but. All the rest of this stuff, we're, we're discussing this. When Joe Biden could have did that on his first day, that's what that Trump executive order has done. And, and Biden still hasn't rescinded that. Ms. Folks, um, look, we're going to keep pressing this thing because, in matter of fact, I'm about to send, I'm about to send, in matter of fact, I'm about to send Michael's piece to Senator Tim Scott right now. And I'm like, dude, I need you to explain yourself. I need you to explain how all of a sudden you're complaining about something you propose. I, I can't wait to get what the answer is. I'm going to send it to his staff as well. Uh, Reddit Hudson, Cheryl Dorsey, Michael Harrod, I really appreciate y'all on the show having this conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right, Roland. See, 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 folks, the, the, the reason why uh, this is vital, I'm going to get our panel on, so y'all let me know uh, when they're on as soon as possible. The, re the reason we have to keep doing this is because I told y'all my position. My philosophy as a journalist has always been, if you do good, I'll talk about you. If you do bad, I'll talk about you. At the end of the day, I'll talk about you. It's always been my position. I've never changed, and I, and I won't change from it. What I'm not going to do, though, is be a damn fool like the rest of these mainstream media people who allow these Republicans to come on TV and obfuscate, make up stuff, lie, spin their way out. I need to know, Margaret Brennan, on Face the Nation, why didn't you 
have this research that Michael put, Michael had. All the staffers y'all got. How is it that you didn't ask him this? Trey Gowdy. You had Tim on Fox News. We know why you didn't do it. Jay Tapper. Should have had it. Ask the Senator Cory Booker. Chuck Todd. What the hell? You the political director of NBC News? How in the hell you didn't have this? Y'all let him come on the show and make the allegation, oh, Dems wanted to defund the police, and no, I wasn't going to support, you know, cutting funds when well, you proposed it. No. No, you are not going to do this. If it was true that Democrats were doing this, and you never proposed it, and it bore out, okay, but Senator Tim Scott, you propose doing what you now criticize. Own up to it. Admit it. It's in the language. But that's what happens when folks play games. Because you know what? They don't expect you to know. But y'all damn sure expect those of us in the media to do the damn research. To check the backstory. And unfortunately, there are too many folks in media, mainstream media, who only care about inviting the same voices back again and again and again. As opposed to challenging them with truth and integrity. Risha Koba, Black Women's Views, joins us right now. Dr. Greg Carr, Department of African American Studies, Howard University. Greg, uh, I'll start with you. Oh, well, I'm, I was waiting. I thought you were going to fight, brother. <laughs> like, I'm still. No, mad. no, no, no. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just bringing you to the floor. Oh, no, brother. I've been watching the whole conversation. Well, we both been watching the whole conversation. And, and so um, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding at the center of this. Both Brother Dorsey and my friend Mike Harriet brought it up. It's, in my mind, this has nothing to do with police reform or police anything, really. This is about control. Now, the only thing that has changed since uh, Senator Scott introduced that bill, the Walter Scott Notification Act, that uh, he folded in as his opening bid and the Justice Act, as, as Mike wrote about, the only thing that has changed is the white nationalist party is no longer in control of the federal government. This is all about the Republican Party. Uh, there's a fundamental un misunderstanding about where we live. I'm, I'm encouraged by all of this because we are closer now to that period you're always talking about, Reconstruction period of the 19th century, than we've been at any time since Reconstruction, including the 1960s. Why do I say that? The white nationalists uh, in this country, and they've been primarily clustered in the South, although not exclusively, this is the attitude of white nationalism toward the federal government. They will either control the federal government or they will force the federal government to acquiesce in what they are doing. This is the basis of federalism, which is why Scott brought it up. The basis of federalism for white nationalism is you either let us do what we want to do or we use the federal mechanism to do what we want to do. So when Tim Scott says that this uh, activity would defund the police, he's not wrong in the sense it would diminish federal resources to the police. But what he proposed when the white nationalists were in part charge of the federal government would rely on the white nationalists in charge of the federal government, allowing the, the state and local authorities to get their money anyway. But now that the, now that the white nationalists are not in control of the federal government, he's worried that the federal government might actually execute what he proposed when there was less of a chance of them doing that. Now, it may sound crazy, but please, we have to understand the, the context for this. There is not a moment, and I, and I would invite anyone who can show me something different. In fact, we were just talking with my law students uh, last night. Uh, there's not a moment in the history of this country when white nationalism hasn't been either in control of the federal government or allowed uh, to do what they want by the federal government. 
the three Fugitive Slave Acts, 1787 Northwest Ordinance, 1820 Compromise of 1820, 1850 the Fugitive Slave Act, the federal government gave cover to the damn white nationalists mm -hmm. in the South. And that led to Dred Scott in 1857, where the Supreme Court basically federalized blackness and said there's no place you are safe. By the way, these bills against abortion in Texas and other places in Mississippi, their move is to get the federal government to acquiesce. So if you think you can go over the border from Texas right. to Louisiana and get an abortion now, when the Supreme Court outlaws it, they're going to do for abortion what they did for slavery with Dred Scott. 1865 to 1877 was the small window when there was a chance to change this project. Because what did Dred Scott lead to? The damn Civil War. And that's where we're headed. After that was over, the North made Got up it. with the South and allowed them to do what they want to do. I'm saying what, what Tim Scott is doing right now is being the front man for white nationalism that is saying, we are going to either Got control it. this government or we're going to make y'all do what you want us to do. Racy? Well, I think that Republicans have the advantage here because Republicans are completely untethered by the truth, by reality, by any kind of conviction, moral core. And that's what Tim Scott has demonstrated unequivocally. And it's also clear that you can't negotiate with terrorists. In order for the Democrats to get anything done, they're going to have to go at it alone. This notion that there's going to be bipartisan support for something as contentious as police reform is absurd. And now, with the shift that we've seen from the what people have called the racial reckoning last year to now where crime is up throughout the country, there's even less of an appetite for Republicans to even pay lip service to any kind of police reform. And that's why, as Karen Bass, our Congresswoman Karen Bass pointed out last week, the Republicans are not even signing up to Trump's executive order to, to codifying that into law. And so... The, I think, you know, when it comes to this poli Justice and Policing Reform Act, I think that it just shows how big of a hill or how steep of a challenge Democrats are going to have in 2022 and explaining why they didn't get this done, because nobody cares. Voters do not care about Senate procedure. They don't care about this person flip-flopping on their views, particularly the person that's in the opposite party. They only care about what you get done. And so, you know, perhaps there are some things that can be done through executive order. Order, but this is going to just end up being another L in the Democrats' column unless they figure out to do something about this filibuster. The one other thing that I will say is I just want to address something that was said about the CBC and, you know, them wielding their power. I think it should be clear that, I mean, the CBC is a very powerful voting block in the House of Representatives. There are only two people in the CBC on the Senate side. And so um, I think that it's a little misleading to try to suggest that they can just blow this whole thing up when all these things are passing in the House. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is passed in the House. There are a right. number of very major legislations that's passed in the House. So I think that this shouldn't revert to some sort of, oh, this is on black people. No, this is on the entire Democratic Party to figure out a way to deal with Manchin and Cinema and anybody else that's hiding behind them in, in regards to re filibuster reform. All right, folks, uh, let's go to some breaking news out of Tennessee, where a Tennessee state senator, Katrina Robinson, was found guilty on four counts of fraud after nearly two week long trial. You might remember we discussed earlier this week when a judge threw out 15 of the 20 counts, but she's found guilty today on four of those counts, not guilty on one of those counts. Uh, senator Robinson joins us right now, along with her attorney, uh, Janika White. Glad to have both of you here. Uh, obviously, uh, Senator, you, you had to have to be disappointed with uh, the verdict uh, by by the jurors here. Um, what what do you make of the prosecutors coming at with you with 20 charges alleging that you were misusing it for personal use? Uh, and for Janika, um, what exactly were the charges that she was found guilty of and how much money were we talking about? Was it was it uh, was it accounting? Was it a uh, filing deadline? Exactly what was it? Well, it was let's first correct that this started as a 48 count indictment. Um, and Got after it. multiple motions, uh, was then reduced to a 20 count indictment. And then the court uh, granted a judgment of acquittal on 15 of those counts. Initially, the government was um, maintaining and accused Senator Robinson of stealing and stealing, embezzling, converting, misapplying $600,000 in grant funds. After the judgment of acquittal, we were down to two counts of wire fraud, totaling $3,484. 
and three counts um, of wire fraud as it pertained to a performance report that testimony showed was completed by administrative assistance within the office. And also the testimony showed that there was absolutely no need for Senator Robinson to change any numbers on this particular port report. One, because the report was not at all related to funding. And two, because she actually met, not only met the expectations under the grant, but she exceeded those expectations um, under the grant. So there was absolutely no need for any changes to be made to these reports. Um, we're just very disappointed, and we, we really, I just really don't understand uh, what was considered back there uh, to come to this to this conclusion. Senator uh, Robinson, Ro, me, um, your go, yes, go ahead. Okay, so Ro, let me let me rewind. So in February of 2020, the federal government raided my home, my school, my residence in Nashville, as well as another business. They took everything that they could take out of our school. They took everything they could take from my home and plastered across. Look, let me go back again. They showed up to my doorstep with the media in tow. They plastered across the screen that I stole $600,000 in federal grant funds, of which I've always maintained that I'm innocent of that. I would never do something like that. We get to trial from this 48 count indictment. We got down to 31 counts. Then we got to 20 counts because the government felt like they were losing their case. So they added three more counts saying that I submitted reports to the federal government to misrepresent information that didn't even need to be misrepresented. We were doing well under the grant. We got nothing but accolades from our grant officer, never got any warning whatsoever. Actually, the investigation started in 2016 from their documentation. But the government didn't get involved until 2019. Meanwhile, the Healthcare Institute was funded every year, every year, Roland, from 2016, 2017, 2018. They gave us money every year. But they said that I was committing a crime of stealing government grant funds. So then we get to trial. There's no proof. They offered no proof. The only thing they offered was a forensic accountant that got up on that stand and with every transaction said, she bought these with grant funds. She bought these with grant funds. Offered no forensic accounting. We got down to the end. The, the judge had to strike her testimony, but still the jurors left with that in their mind. Even though we've gotten to $3,484 that now they're alleging that I stole from my own business. That's where we are. What is the impact on your, uh, with, with these uh, four convictions, what is the impact on your state Senate seat? Um, that is yet to be determined, Roland. Of course, the, the process is not over. We are still moving forward to ask the judge to reconsider what has happened before the jury. Uh, we do not think that the jury had a full picture of what was actually happening. This was a very complicated case that I don't think a layman or the average person would be able to understand without thorough background. Um, and so we're still going to fight uh, what the jury has, has let out. Janika, final comment. Yeah, we, we're going to file a motion for a new trial. Um, and if that doesn't work, we have a couple of other avenues uh, to pursue. Um, it's, of course, not what we wanted. But as she said, we've been trying a long, tough, rough road here when you have a prosecution that uh, started with a, this presumption of guilt without any opportunity of participation in it to be able to explain anything, say anything. And I think this prosecution is most telling when you um, say it's in defense of a theft from a government organization a, uh, as a result of a grant. And when the entity that was giving the grant that was in constant communication with her was not the complainant, uh, even in court came in still saying, you know, this was a great organization, successful, doing what it was supposed to do. We were in constant communication. Um, this place was thriving. Uh, the project officer was um, excited about the growth, uh, impressed with the growth. So it's just a really unique situation. And even the statute that this was charged under 666, if you go, you can't find another case charged any, you, you cannot find it. You cannot find another case even similar to this one uh, on the books. Uh, we've researched, we've tried, you cannot find it in this context. And the, the judge uh, rightly pointed out that throughout this process, the government's theory 
of prosecution has changed many times because, again, it was with the purpose of an intent of saying we're going to find whatever we can after we sift through these thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents, we're going to get to whatever we can find. And at the end of the day, they found uh, an email and we got down to $3,484 uh, and errors on a report that she didn't even complete. Um, so. Well, folks, uh, we appreciate uh, both of you, uh, Janika and um, Senator Robertson, for joining with us. Uh, you could have talked to a lot of folks, uh, and you only uh, are uh, submitted to an uh, interview uh, with us. And we certainly appreciate you uh, joining with, with this exclusive conversation. Thank you so very much. Uh, and we'll be Thank following you, uh, the next steps uh, in this case. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so very much. Folks, got to go to. Thank you very much. Got to go to a quick break, folks. And we come back. Our Tech Talk segment. We talk about Black Star Network owning, African Americans owning, not waiting for somebody else to give us a shot. Well, that's what Kev on stage has done. You've seen his TikTok video. You've seen him on Twitter. Well, he's next right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Before Till's murder, we saw struggle for civil rights as something grown-ups did. I feel that the generations before us have offered a, a lot of instruction. Organizing is really one of the only things that gives me the sanity and makes me feel purposeful. When Emmett Till was murdered, yeah. that's what attracted our attention. Hi, I'm Vivian Green. You're hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered. <laughs> So last week, uh, a lot of black people were angry and upset uh, that you didn't have any African-Americans win any of the acting categories at the Emmys. People were talking on Instagram and Twitter and all over the place. Well, comedian Kev on stage is like, why y'all are doing all this bitching and moaning tr because trying to sit here and look at white validation? He said, if you create your own, you can celebrate your own. He dropped the video. A lot, a lot of people talking about that. And he said, that's exactly what he did. I know the feeling. Because that's what the hell I did. Joining us right now is Kev on Stage, uh, the founder of uh, Kev on Stage uh, Studios. What's up, Doc? Hey, how you doing, Roland? Thank you so much for having me. Quick apology to the, the people in your live chat. My stage crew was so excited that we had this opportunity. We went in there and put a whole bunch of emojis. They were like, hey, man, we're trying to, we trying to talk to Roland. <laughs> so I apologize to the people watching. We did not mean it. <laughs> we used right, to show up and we show love. And they was like, hey, don't worry about all it. that noise. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Look, folk, folk talk all the time. It's all good. Uh, that's why we have folks communicating. It's all right. The, the, the thing that you're doing, and, and in fact, Reese's on our panel, and uh, she and I talked about it beforehand because uh, she's like, you got to get Kev on the show. But it, yeah. it's, it, it's, it really boils down to not, not trying to sit here and beg somebody else, please, pretty please, can you give me a show? Can you give me an opportunity? Versus saying, you know what? I'm good. We yeah. can take the same technology, use our smarts, and create our own, and then control it. Absolutely. I think uh, we, you know, what you're doing with this show right now, this is a national news show. This is a Black-owned network. Like, you know, as people, we have to take our, our, our future in our hands, but we also have to support the people who are doing it as well. I think a lot of times, you know, we get into the, if it ain't this, it ain't that, it ain't real, and things like that. If it ain't CNN, like, to me, this is more important. Like, people like Reese, this is how I get my opportunities. People like you, you, Black people end up checking for Black people way before national news does, way before anybody's paying attention. So why are we, you know, why are we looking for approval when we can create and distribute to our people right there? No middleman, no filter, no showrunner who doesn't understand black culture telling you, well, we've got to appease middle America. You know how many times I've heard what does middle America think about this? Black people live in middle America. What do you, black people live everywhere in the right. United States. But middle Where America the hell is St. Louis, Minneapolis, <laughs> Chicago? There you go. Chicago. That's what it, when they say America. fly over states, middle America, they are not talking about black people. 
No, it's a it's a code word to say what do white people think about this? But some of my biggest support is in Middle America. Black people are everywhere in the United States, Seattle to Miami to Wichita, Kansas. So and and we watch stuff. We and we we've often you know, we had no choice. Honestly, before we didn't have a lot of black owned networks. We didn't have a lot of uh, people who were creating their own stuff, you know, and now we have the internet, which is the great equalizer and it allows people like you and I to create and distribute directly to our audience, right? We use platforms like YouTube and, and Facebook and things like that to get our word out. But at the end of the day, we own our own platform. So if those platforms decide we don't want this anymore, or we don't care about this, or our album's not going to uh, push this anymore, then we have our own platform that we control. And and that's kind of the main reason I did this, because there's been times as a YouTuber where YouTube decide we're going to change focus. And what was a huge business model right. for me became zero. And I'm like, I didn't even I remember when Logan Paul so, got so, in so, trouble. No, no, no. I, so, and, 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 I, I, I want you to pause right there because I need people, okay. people watching to understand what he just said. When they change the algorithm. Yeah. I need all of y'all listening. Y'all hear me always talk about the business of the business. When mm -hmm. they change the algorithm. You could be doing 80, 90, 100,000 yeah. dollars a month and all of a sudden they make a shift, it drops to 30, 40. So that means exactly. here you built a staff, you're paying people, so now you got to go find 50, 60, 70 grand somewhere else per month to keep paying your staff. And so, when right. you talk about creating your own app, folks, this is no different. I need everybody listening. Kev on stage studio. Black Star Network is the exact same as Fox Nation. This new CNN Plus Discovery app is no different than Peacock. Or it, it's, the, it's the same technology. The difference is we own it. And not only do we own it, Kevin, this, Kevin, this is people don't understand. We can, because we own the content, we now have a library. We now can right. license the content. We, if someone now, hey, I want to use this in a documentary, okay, this is what it's going to cost you. Whereas right. at TV One, they say, bro, I want to use your interview. Money with the TV One. Ain't coming to roll. Yeah. That's what yes. people don't understand about the business of the business. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of times in YouTube. Logan Paul, for example, I don't know if you remember this. He made a video in the Suicide Force in Japan. Everybody suffered when he made that mistake. Ad dollars went down for everyone. A year or two uh, ago, YouTube decided that family-friendly content, um, they weren't going to be able to run ads on that. So people who were making literally, like you said, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month went down to 100, 200. YouTube decided there's no more comments on those videos. Therefore, there's no community. I remember my comments got turned off about three or four years ago. The community was gone instantly. So I, I don't want to have... Some other company have control over what I say. And I use their platforms to, to promote to mine, but I'm using them as a means to an end. My, my ultimate hope is that I don't need them at all. But right now, the Kev on Stage Studio right. streaming service is, to, is smaller than my other platforms, but I'm slowly getting the word out to people like, we, we, we can either complain about the status quo or we can decide, I'm going to invest uh, in, in something that I want to see. If you want to invest in a, a person who's decided I'm going to make content for black people, I'm going to highlight black women, I'm going to let them create their own shows, you can see that on, on the app. You can see that I'm a man of my word, that the team is here. We own this studio that I'm in right now. We can uh, we can license our own shows that we created in the studio we own. We let people use this and we charge Boom. them for production. So we own it 100%. The only people that we cater to is the audience, and that is black people. That's We have a saying, it's for black people anyway, uh, because I don't even want somebody who it's not intended for to criticize it. Like, if you don't get this joke, because I remember, Roland, I was pitching somebody this show that we are now making, uh, and he was like, you know, I don't think I don't think black people will get this. This is a, a, a middle-aged white man who never experienced anything I was talking about. And this is basically <laughs> my life story. He told me, I don't think black people are going to get this. And I was like, how do you know? How would you know that? You, what black people, you live in LA, you're an agent in LA, you have no idea what black people will get. But they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones that decide whether you make it or not. So I decided uh, with the support I have from the stage crew and my Patreon and people who have bought the app or bought T-shirts and merch, I saved all that money and we create our own content and we'll let them be the judge. And then I guarantee you what happens is once it pops off, now you license it. Now we can put that money back into the ecosystem and they'll be like, oh, we knew all along. Watch two or three years from now when Roland Martin, oh, I've been, been new about Roland. But I see what people say on Twitter. Oh, you ain't even on CNN no more. So... 
you are in a better position now than you ever right. could have been on somebody else's. I don't think people understand. You don't need CNN. You are your own they CNN. Don't. You're just, you they are don't. the owner. They don't. And, what they don't. and what they don't realize is, what they don't understand is, I got, I got, a, I got a call two weeks ago. They want to bring some black uh, media influencers uh, to Dubai. And they were like, yo, uh, Roland, Roland be one of the people. And I said, sure, let's go. When I had the Liberian ministers on a few weeks ago, they're going to be celebrating their 200th anniversary. Uh, I said, yo, we're going to bring the show to Liberia. Now, everybody listening, I don't want everybody you know, saying that. If I say we're going to bring the show to Liberia, I don't have to go ask somebody permission. Because guess, and there's no disrespect. This is no disrespect to anybody black at CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC, NBC, CBS. But the reality is this. Joanne Reed, Don Lemon, Robin Roberts, you can name anybody. They got to go ask somebody. Right. Can I? Mm -hmm. Kev, what Kev is saying is Kev doesn't have to go ask somebody. I don't have yeah. to ask somebody. So now, and we can, and then we say, you know what? We're going to go live here. We're going to broadcast live for four hours. Mm -hmm. We don't have an exec on, but your show's only two. No, we're going to go four. People, go four. that's the difference of owning. Yes. I do want to make one clarifying statement, Roland. I do have to ask one person. That's my wife. She's the CFO. Uh, she do say whether I can do it, but I don't have to ask nobody <laughs> else. If me and my wife agree, <laughs> then we can go oh, and I'm do sorry. it. No, we have I, to be, I, <laughs> be I, clear. I, I, <laughs> now, 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 look, I got... Let, let's be clear. I, I, I got a wife, but I ain't got to ask Jackie. <laughs> so, so me, I run it so just, so I'm just saying. Me, so you gotta, see, we got, see, we, see, we got lanes. I don't even ask my CFO because, see, I check the bank account every day. <laughs> see, uh, uh, I got a CFO, but trust me, Ro knows how much money's in there. I know how much money's coming. And so that's what we do. Now, Jackie, she, she a minister. She pray. She pray folk <laughs> away. She pray folk to come. She pray for money to come. But I ain't right. got to ask nobody. But <laughs> it's, it's all good. I, I, I do, I do want to get my panel here and ask some questions. I'm going to go to Reese first. Because sure. Reese's like, Rollin, Rollin, you got to get Kev on the show. You got to get Kev on the show. Uh, Reese, go. Hey, Kev. I am hey, so Reese. excited you're here. Thank um, you. So, I and I want to thank you because you shouted cool. me out before. And you were the first person that I that I saw from a national platform was like, look at what Kev's doing. So I, I never got a chance to thank you face to face. So I want to say thank you. Well, thank you very much. Next <laughs> time, can you tag me in the video so I can get some of your followers? <laughs> you reposted my video and y'all did get nominated for that NAACP Image Awards because that yeah, wasn't on the horizon up. That was me, but okay. Did. But just just tag me next time. That's all I'm saying. I got you. But, I got you. <laughs> but um, I have to say I'm a huge fan. My husband is an even bigger fan. He's a subscriber to Kev on Stage Studios. Thank he watches you, all your stuff. We watch the Keep Your Distance comedy every time. Oh, wow. hey, that Thank coin. You. Yes, we watched it every single two, every two weeks. That's when it was. Yes, ma'am. And then yes, you had ladies night. It was all kind of stuff. I was like, okay, look at Kev on stage. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My, what I wanted to ask you, though, and I think Roland can um, understand with his launch of Black Star Network, you all have so many followers on your different platforms, but mm. it's hard to convert those followers. Yeah. Now, for Black Star Network, it's free. For yours, it's a, it's a subscription. How mm -hmm. do you think we move the needle so that people who really support you, diehard fans, recognize the value of going through your own Black-owned platforms as opposed to, well, it's convenient, I'm already scrolling on Twitter, I'm already scrolling on here. You know, how do you balance between exclusive content and still trying to reel people in so that you can keep your name buzzing and your brand building? Absolutely. I think that's a great question, and it's a two-part uh, difficulty. The first part is these platforms don't want people to leave their platform and go anywhere. So mm -hmm. the Instagram algorithm is designed to keep you on Instagram. So by default, if I'm saying, hey, leave Instagram and go to Kevin Stage Studios, and it realizes people are clicking off of my video and going somewhere else, it's going to immediately suppress that video. Same mm. thing with Twitter. 
Facebook because you are now by default doing the opposite of what that platform wants you. So my other videos that are designed for you to consume on those yeah. platforms, they say people are watching these stay on. So it's nearly impossible without using paid media, which is what they want you to do. They want you to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars using their ad services. Now they'll run your ads because you're going to, if they're going to lose a dollar, they're not going to lose two. So you're going to pay them. If they're going to leave the platform, it's go okay if you pay them. So that's one mm. thing. And the second thing is as black people, we have to value the things that black people make. A lot of times, mm. the reason we're frustrated with the Grammys and the Oscars and all that is because we have decided this is the most valuable award and being on Netflix is the most valuable platform and, and this and that. But black folks could make anything popular. When we all was yeah. wearing uh, K-Swiss, K-Swiss is popping. Air Force Ones is popping. We all drinking Alizé. Alizé is now <laughs> making billions of dollars. If we decided, forget all that. We're going to decide mm -hmm. that this is cool and we're doing this now, it would change immediately. So I think there's, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of resources. I'm going to have to, you know, have a lot of marketing budget. Unfortunately, we're a very small company right now. So the marketing budget we have right now is just making the content, but the ideology has to yep. shift. If we think as black people, this is just as dope. And, and it's on me to make content that is just as dope. So they can be like, well, shoot, this looks just like right. something I'd watch on another platform. And I'll do my part if you guys will consume and do your part and say, you know what, Kev, I'm going to give you my five instead of, and I'm not saying cancel Netflix and all of them, but maybe just one, you know, maybe come off Discovery Plus and, and come over <laughs> to me. I still, I right. still got Netflix, you know, so if we do those two things, we'll have, have success. But at the bottom line is, is people like you receive advocating for me, rolling, bringing me on. This is, this is the most, um, the biggest platform we've had. This is the biggest time we've been able to talk about what we what we're doing. So we're very appreciative of that, and 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 that's how it works. And I need people to understand what what Kay was talking about, how they suppress. Uh, I'm gonna tell y'all right now. We know for a fact, and I've called them out, and I keep calling them out. Facebook. Supp is suppressing our live notifications. I have 1.3 million Facebook followers. How do we know they're suppressing it? Because my digital director does not get the live notifications. When, when y'all see the countdown clock, when we go live, the reason we do that, because we go live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter slash Periscope, and, and then also Instagram. And so we want to give people a chance to connect. He doesn't get the live notification and he's the one who turned the damn button on. And I have emailed Facebook, oh, there's a, bug, there's a bug in our system. No, here's what they want to do. What Facebook is trying to force me to do, Facebook is trying to force me to pay to boost to people who already follow me, who've already clicked live notification. Yes, sir. So y'all got to understand how, and so that's, that's why right now, so it's 3,487 people who are watching us on YouTube. If I go over to Facebook right now, uh, just so y'all understand, 3,487 people are watching us right now on YouTube. And we have 800,000 uh, su subscribers on YouTube. First of all, that's actually a great conversion rate when you actually break it down. Right now on Facebook, there are three, there are 322 people watching on Facebook right now, and I have 1.3 million followers. All right. Absolutely. That folks. And so, and, and, and so what y'all need to understand, so what, what Kev is doing with his app, and I was on the phone with Vimeo earlier, we've actually surpassed, I think, 15,000, and they're like, yo, 15,000 downloads in less than a month? That's damn good. But yeah. what people have to understand is we want to have 50,000 by December 31st. We want to have 100, because when we are able to now have 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 downloads, then to Kev's point, we can begin to migrate folks away from these platforms. Like he says, they don't like that, but that gives us far more control and Kev gets to actually charge advertisers a premium. He can, we, yeah. can, we can run free roll commercials. We can yep. do the exact, listen to me, people. We can do the exact same thing that Peacock, that BET yes. Plus, that yeah. all the other apps can do. That's the difference. And so that's, that's, why, that's why this is vital. Greg Carr, your question. Um, thank you, Roland. And I'm sitting here taking notes, brother. I'm sitting here listening <laughs> because 
uh, you know, you build in maroon spaces. Uh, my, my, my friend Holly Grima calls them liberated territories. So, Brother Kev, it's, it, it's a pleasure to hear you, brother, and I just followed Thank you on you. Twitter. And, you know, uh, let me ask you, I mean, um, and you've already kind of answered this, um, but, you know, given that these things are, aren't accidental, that they're curating an audience, they're creating taste, even as we mm-hmm. create content, how, mm-hmm. do, how do we break through um, seizing yeah. control of our own, uh, the way that we view the world, because this thing is being curated. We act like it's our choice, but it's really being curated. And then maybe just very quickly, and Roland, you, actually you triggered this question in my mind. How important is cooperation and networking it's in, in moments yeah. like this? I mean, how important is it to build that team together? Because individuals don't beat institutions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think Thank you so much for the question. Uh, the first answer is there's no algorithm that can beat you telling me you've got to watch this. you got to download this. You're going to love this. This is a mm. show I've been watching. There's no algorithm that can beat you texting me a link and saying this is this show's on this app. Check it out. It's worth the $5.99. It's worth the $50. The algorithm can't beat somebody who you trust telling you you got to watch something. For example, there's a show go, uh, going viral on, on uh, Twitter called Squid Game on Netflix. Never heard of it, but I see my friends, hey, man, this Squid Game thing is dope. Memes going about it. I mean, think about how many times black Twitter alone has single-handedly made a show popular. I remember when Bird Box came out. Never heard of it. Didn't see a trailer, anything. Sitting at my uh, father-in-law's house during Christmas, black Twitter starts sharing memes about Bird Box. It becomes a dominating t- platform topic. What do I do? Y'all, we got to check this Bird Box thing out. Everybody's talking about it. That's marketing that Netflix doesn't have to pay for. Same thing with mm-hmm. the Popeye's chicken sandwich. And I'm a part of that. Everybody on Twitter's talking about it. I go try and make a video about it. Popeye's didn't spend $1. Just in black media, the earned media that companies get for free is mm-hmm. you couldn't pay for it. You couldn't pay for the amount of earned media that black people get just for talking about it. So if we decided this is a topic of conversation, I'm going to check it out because I want to do this. I'm tired of complaining about not being seen in these spaces. I don't know how much more clear these white spaces can make it that they don't care. They'll do enough (laughs) to appease us. They'll do enough. They'll get black presenters and you would nominate some people, maybe give an award out to. But it comes to those most prestigious things and them show writing credits and them writing credits. They're not going to give those out by and large. And eventually, if we decide, you know what, we don't care anymore, then the value of those spaces decreases tremendously. But it Mm -hmm. takes black people being like, we now think this is cool now. When Tommy Hilfiger, when black folks, when I was a kid, said Tommy Hilfiger is cool. It's now cool. So um, I was talking so much, I forgot yep. your your second question. Cooperation. Oh, cooperation. Cooperation. I, yeah, so I, I'm, well, I'm sorry. Well, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, I have a group of friends who are just getting ready to launch their own streaming service, and they reached out and asked me for advice on how to. For the last four or five months, I've been basically consulting them for free. Why? Because I want black people to win. And I don't want black people to win. I don't want to win at the expense of my people. And they have a bigger audience than me. They're going to they gonna do better than me at, at the jump. And I love that. And one day we can make a movie together and pull our resources together. The same way Adam Sandler and Judd Apatow, they tag the same for, hey, y'all, let's do a movie together. We'll put our own money in. That's the same mm-hmm. thing that I want to do. Tab another, uh, uh, tap some other influence, say, y'all, let's, let's put 50K in each and make a micro budget film for 200K. And then let's license that for $3 million, split that money and then reinvest it and do another one. And guess what? We can do our, our Napoleon Dynamite are uh, I got the hookups, those low-budget films. Friday was a supremely low-budget film for what it did. And once yeah. black people start saying, yo, if we actually support them and buy that stuff, then they can make better stuff. And then we can create our own little world and our own ecosystem of black creators. And you can have people like me who you can trust that when I say I'm going to uh, make some shows for black women, you will see them. The first show we made on the Kevin Stage Studio streaming service, the first original show we made was for a black woman. Since then, we've had four or five, and we got three or four more in development that are slated to release at the end of this year or the top of next year. So we want to see those things. It takes us saying, I support you. Here's $50. Take it for the year. I trust you. I'm going to buy merch. I'm going to buy your comedy show. For all intents and purposes, all the money I earn goes right back into this. So if you support me in any way, uh, that's how you can support. Thank you. Mm. Well, and the other thing is this here. Here's, Here's my philosophy, Kev. 
Everybody can eat. It's enough out yeah. here. I'm not. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going. I'm not going to sit. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and retweet something Kev said. Cause you know what? Uh, 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 that, that's. I mean, no. I, I'm just going. No. We are. We all can do that. And, and that's what we talk about. Also, again, we have resources. Look, I tell everybody. We started. Hey, we couldn't afford the, can, the Canon C300s. Hell, the body alone was nine thousand. The lenses were, no, were another six, eight thousand. We had the Canon XA twenty five. We upgraded to the Canon XF four or five four K cameras. Now we own five Canon C three hundreds. Okay, mm -hmm. so same thing. Office space that we're building out, the ability to be able to rent it out for other people. And when we building the studio out, set designer black, lighting dude black. He got paid. The engineers who did the, did the control room black. They got paid. Uh, Everybody black got paid. That's yeah. so when you create something, you also get to decide who you use as contractors. And so a right. lot of people need need to need to understand that. But we are so we are so ingrained when it comes to this notion of white validation and white acceptance that we degrade our own when we are not just as good, we can even be better. Got a first time panelist, Dr. Pamela Hill, assistant professor of social work, University of Texas at Arlington, where I spoke last night. Uh, she also, uh, African American uh, studies there as well. Dr. Hill, your question for Kevin on stage. Hey, how you doing? What's going I'm on? I'm good. How are you? Nothing much. Yes, wonderful. Hey, uh, thank you, brother, for that, because it's so very important that we understand what our power can be. And I yeah. appreciate you. I'm going to make sure that my students know about you. I'm going to make Thank sure that you. they follow you. And Thank that you they so much. Purposely build. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's it. You ain't got a question? She like, I'm, that's how, <laughs> I, she's just going to say, I'm going to let them know. Yes, okay. Yes, yes, I do. My question, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. My question is, is what advice can you give me to share with my students? Uh, particularly those in African American studies, of how they can be focused enough to build their own. Yeah, I think um, you can follow in the similar footsteps that I had. To Roland's point, um, this time that we're in, it's the easiest time to create. Uh, for the majority of my business, and almost all of my videos are made with this iPhone, right? I don't, I didn't have money like like Roland said for a Canon or an Ari or a Red, and Apple and Android have made these phones great. So you know the old adage is you know, use what you have. Uh, I built a lot of this using my iPhone. Use those platforms that you have until you can build your you know your brand up. And then you start to say, hey, man, this is what we're doing over here. Once you get people who support you, let them know what you're trying to do. And the most important thing is to be authentic. I think one of the reasons that we had a lot of success over here is because I think the people that support me, the stage crew, the ones who join and watch live, especially for my Patreon, they are willing to support monetarily and they'll pull up and support anything. But I think it's come from me being a person who is who I say I am. Same, similar to Roland. Roland on, on this show is pretty much the same way he is on, on Twitter, the same way he is when I used to see him on TV. Um, I think we... Same uh, are, damn way. <laughs> <laughs> people are past the age of, of, of a carefully created brand, and people uh, appreciate the authentic version of you. I think people support that more. And also, have a story. What are you trying to do? I, I ask Patreon for money. I ask them to increase their, their, their gift, and I tell them what I'm doing with that. When I hired a black woman as a co-host, I said, I'm going to take a proportion of y'all money and give it to her, and I'm going to pay her above market. I'm going to pay her the same thing I pay a black a black man, maybe even more. And people be like, okay, you know what, Kev? I'm going to trust you. And then she goes out and buys a house, and you're like, okay, dang, well, Kev, maybe Kev really is a man of his word. So I think um, it, all that goes into play. But at the end of the day, start with what you have and build what you can. And as you grow it, know you have an exit plan. I've always known that eventually I have to build something that's going to go off of these platforms because they rise and fall. Vine came and went. TikTok was musically. Mm -hmm. Now it's a huge thing. Uh, uh, YouTube has switched platforms three, three or four times. Clubhouse had a rise and fall within the pandemic. It was the whole thing for two or three months. And then people mm -hmm. were just like, nah. I don't care anymore. And then or Twitter created audio spaces and Facebook created their own uh, competition, a clubhouse. So with all those things, it's going to be hard to compete with Silicon Valley. But if you talk directly to your audience and give your audience exactly what they need, you'll always have a chance to win. 
cool. Thank you so uh, much. Absolutely, of folks. Course. What what we're talking about and, and what what Kev just said that we talk about giving opportunity it was a perfect example. There were a lot of people who were sitting there. They were like, "Man, who this foul mouth ass woman always talking about Kamala Harris?" And I was <laughs> like, "Yo." I said, these videos are hilarious. And I was <laughs> people were going like, oh my God, you're not gonna have that woman on your show. I was like, yeah, I yeah, am, because yeah, I BG. own this shit. <laughs> 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 but again though, and that's the, and, and see and, and see, Kev, what people don't what people don't understand, and this is the last last point to you. And I, here's the deal. I'm not tripping. I'm not tripping, and I ain't got no problem with Tiffany Cross on Saturday, and when she says, "Who was the first person to put me on on his panel to talk about politics?" It was Roland. Mm -hmm. Got her Saturday show. I'm gonna be on her show on Saturday. When yeah. I see Angela Rye, Laura Coates, when she when Laura Coates, when y'all see Laura Coates on CNN uh, filling in guest hosting, ask her which show does she guest host first. Mm -hmm. News one now. Ask yeah. when you see Neil Malika Henderson hosting. Mm -hmm. Ask her what was the first TV show she appeared on consistently. Roland Martin's Washington Watch. Paul Butler mm -hmm. doing legal analysis, getting paid on MSNBC. Washington Watch as well. Uh, Gianna Caldwell on Fox News. Did nobody put his ass on TV? <laughs> Until he was on News One now. So the thing, the thing is, we by by creating and owning our platforms. We are tapping into talent that they will never give a shot to say, mm -hmm. come show what you can do. That's Absolutely. also why it matters. Absolutely. 100 percent. I totally final agree. Kevin, my final, final comment. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And to the people who are already supporting people watching now, um, you you matter that five ninety nine or that fifty dollars a year. It is going to be used. Well, uh, we can either complain or. Or we can mm. change. And I, you know, the mm -hmm. Kevin on Stage Studio streaming service is an opportunity to align your dollars with your values. If you really believe mm. that you want black content to win and you want to see black content that represents the entire gamut of what black people can be, everything from fantasy drama to to uh, uh, irreverent comedies, all of that stuff. Then, then entrust black people to create content that represents them. Because when it represents me, it'll represent you. And I appreciate your support. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Reese, especially. Thank, Thank you. you. Stage crew, Patreon. I love you all. Thank you guys so much. Wow. All right, Kev on stage. I appreciate it, folks. Download the app. I've already downloaded the app. Uh, and he says, $59.99. I'm going to send you some money. Uh, cause you, you absolutely right. It, it is important. Uh, and right. Every dollar matters. Uh, you know, one yeah. of the reasons why I didn't set up black start network as a subscription service, because there are a lot of people who send us $1 who can't afford the monthly. And I get it. Uh, and I said, so we're going to build it, which is why I'm out, which is why I'm out here kicking these advertisers ass. And guess what? All y'all advertisers who gave OZ all that money, my number's real. Oh, 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 mm. oh, 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 don't do it, Roland, don't do it, brother. My numbers are, my numbers are real. I'm just saying. <laughs> Cam, on stage, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a appreciate lot. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, guys. Have a great show. All right. Folks, be sure to download the app. Got to go to a break. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about uh, dropping cannabis cases in Los Angeles. And also, Governor Gavin Newsom clears the way for a prominent beach to be returned to the family of a black couple who was chased off that property decades ago. That's next on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Oh, no Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with Roland all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own. A black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all.
can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Hi, I'm Eric Nolan. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, some of y'all uh, who love being stuck on stupid, all the talking about, man, this voting stuff don't matter. Actually, it does, especially when we elect district attorneys who are not these hard asses who are all about crime and lock them up. When you elect progressive DAs, then you take, you see what happens, what will they happen in LA? Well, they dismiss some 60,000, 60,000 uh, cannabis cases. LA district attorney moved, uh, uh, moved to do that. And remember, this was, this was the district attorney who used to be the DA in San Francisco, comes to uh, Los Angeles, beats Jackie Lacey, who's a black DA. Now, now let me stop right there. Again, white man becomes DA. He does what the black DA would not do. Don't always get caught up in if it's a black DA. In Philadelphia, the last black DA that was corrupt went to prison. You got uh, Krasner. Uh, first of all, you, got now, you now got a white DA much more progressive. And so I just want y'all to understand uh, why we uh, talk about that uh, on the show. Uh, a lot of people don't quite understand that. And so uh, that's the difference that took place in Los Angeles County uh, when George Gascon, Gascon uh, won beating uh, Jackie Lacey. Some of these cases go back 30 years. Joining us right now is Felicia Carbajal from L.A., the executive director of Social Impact. Uh, Felicia, glad to have you on Roller Mart Unfiltered. Walk people through... As I just set up there, why this is so critically important um, to have the right DA in office. Um, well, first, I want to thank you so much, Roland, for having me here. And I'm very excited and honored to be here. And in terms of your question, um, it matters a lot. We had engaged in conversations in the past about what did it look, what did it look like to actually help remediate all of these cases. It kind of just fell flat. Um, this office was very, very different. Um, funny enough, on 420, I was on a panel with uh, DA Tiffany Blacknell, this amazing black woman who listened and went back and shared information with her boss uh, about me just having the audacity to ask. Um, we had essentially known that Jackie Lacey had helped with 66,000, removing uh, convictions for 66,000 people. And those of us who live in Los Angeles knew that that number couldn't be real. And, you know, it became a very simple process in terms of I brought up an article and the rest is history. We had an active DA, um, active uh, liaisons in his office who were listening to the community, really wanting to hear. So what's monumental about this is 58,000 Angelinos are going to be receiving not just their record expunged, but their record sealed. And as you mentioned, it's going to go back, you know, all the way to the 70s. 20,000 of them have felony convictions for cultivation or sales, which as we know, just for anybody who's getting this kind of legal relief, it's removing those 48,000 barriers that exist across the country, uh, 5,000 specifically here in Los Angeles that bar us from places like education, housing, employment, um, licensing, and the list goes on and on. So what's monumental is that we found somebody who would listen and then who did. Like when I tell everybody how fast it happened and sometimes I'm still pinching myself that uh, we were able to just challenge this district attorney's office and that they rose to the occasion, um, it, that's what makes it so monumental. It was just literally asking them doing their job and coming back with, oh, you're right. And then putting everything else into action. 
And also, what by doing this, you're, it clears up the opportunity for people uh, to actually now jobs, housing, because that criminal record was stopping them from being a full citizen. Absolutely. I mean, that's what was so crucial with all of this is that those barriers, if we're talking about 30 or 40 years, people have grown accustomed to them. So this new lease on life, this new ability to be able to navigate into spaces that have barred us from participating in. Like when we think about these numbers specifically in Los Angeles, we already recognize that a third of the people who've been arrested for cannabis related convictions are black. We've got another 42 percent that are Latino. That means 75 percent of black and brown bodies have specifically been targeted. And we wonder when we look in the streets of L.A. and other places, how did we get here? It's because of this overcriminalization, not specifically to cannabis, but across the board. So I'm just honored to be able to do my little part and contribute and be a part of this great, amazing work, um, not just with my nonprofit, but on the national level with national expungement works and all of these amazing things. I mean, we got to kick off this week of action and awareness on our fourth year with just hitting a home run right off the bat. So I'm grateful. All right, Felicia Carbajal, we certainly appreciate all the work that you did uh, making this happen. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Dr. Hill, Hill, I want to start with you. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Dr. Hill, I want to start with you because, again, we get these people, they're like, oh, voting, man, that stuff don't matter. This is why it matters. Who you elect as DA or as a judge can determine who goes to, to get the further adjudication, who goes to prison. Exactly. You know, Martin, one thing that I stress with my students, I, I said, well, if it's not important, why is it always under attack? I tell people, if you're not voting, you know, you don't you need to be quiet because you're not saying anything because you're not voting. You're not using that power. And particularly even at the local elections, that's extremely important. I challenge people around me, particularly in the African Senate community, if you're conscious, black power is black voting power. And if all you're doing is complaining, you need to go somewhere else and complain because you're not making an impact on anything by opening your mouth and complaining. Take your butt to the polls and vote. Do the research. Do the research and know who you're voting for. Uh, know who your council persons are. Make sure that you engage yourself because if we understand that a big part of citizenship is, is having the right to vote, if we understand that when the 13th Amendment said, except those who are incarcerated, the first thing they take away is your power to vote. I challenge everybody around me, you know, if you're really black, if you believe in black power, then you need to vote, period. And I also encourage people around me, if you don't like the way something is, consider running for office. Consider first getting involved, going, you know, being involved, being being on a, a political committee. Talk to your council person. See how you can be involved and make sure that you register and vote and to push because one of the first things, you know, that I recall is that I grew up in the 60s. My mother couldn't vote until she was in her 40s. I never realized why after she would pick me up from school, she would rush to vote, why it was so important. I didn't get that. But when I turned 18, at the, uh, I was at Langston University, and I'll never forget the Deltas and Omegas had a voter registration drive. And they were standing outside the union. They said, are you 18? Have you registered? Get over here and register to vote. So I was 18 years old, and I really did not know anything about it. But all I know is that Randy Thomas said, come over here and vote, register, and I did. I've been voting every since. I voted in every election, and I encourage my students particularly to vote. Uh, and again, if we don't do it, we don't have a voice and we don't understand how powerful that vote is. So it's extremely, especially in Texas or Texas, we understand that folks in Texas has, have lost their last peace of mind. And if the young people don't make sure that they are educated, don't make sure that they are out here voting and using their voices, you know, 
we are going to be in a lot of trouble. So again, it's important because indeed. we understand. Yes. And indeed, uh, Reese, um, when, when we talk about again these cases, these are people who now get to actually live, who now uh, get uh, to 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 participate. Uh, by removing this. And again, some of these cases go back 30 years. Absolutely. I mean, it's so important to get a clean slate. I mean, we've seen a lot of Republicans, like former Speaker John Boehner, reinvent himself and be pro legalized marijuana, or at least pro uh, the marijuana, the legalized marijuana businesses that he's involved in. And so, it's really important to not leave people behind based on you know decades old attitudes towards marijuana and can cannabis. And I think the other important thing to point out here is the uh, the district attorney thought that their work was originally done because they had expunged these records of Department of Justice recorded cases. This advocacy group came in and identified an additional 60,000 cases. So I think it goes to show that civic engagement doesn't stop at the ballot box. Civic engagement includes supporting uh, advocacy groups and people who are doing the work. You know, a lot of what are these politicians do is because they're pushed. It's because people are engaged on the issues. And you can't assume that because something is important to you or to your particular community, that all of the resources are being put behind that in these district attorney's office, attorney general, senate office, et cetera, et cetera. There are limited resources. And a lot, if you talk to politicians, a lot of them will say they don't have the budget and the funds necessarily to put behind, I don't want to call it a pet cause because this is obviously a very significant issue, but behind a particular area of focus. And so it's important if you, if you have a cause, whether it's cannabis expungement or whether it's, you know, anything under the sun, get behind those specific organizations. Don't just look towards the national organizations like ACLU. Look towards what your local community organizations are doing or take it upon yourself to do something that you think can make an impact. And come to your come sometimes you have to come to your politicians with solutions instead of just complaints. And and to piggyback on that point, Greg, again, this was the actions of local people and a local DA. We say this all the time, everything does not happen out of Washington, D.C. On the federal level, we talk about people who are in prison. Only 10 percent of the people in federal prison uh, in prison on the federal level. Ninety percent mm -hmm. are in state prisons and local jails. Absolutely. Well, I, mean, I, I just echo what uh, we've heard Dr. Hill saying and what you just said, Reese. You know, this is full spectrum warfare. That means the vote. That means organizing. That means everything from. And I see you repping Langston. You got to represent Langston, uh, Dr. Hill. I love that. Uh, you say as a teenager, you got young people saying, "How you registered to vote? Come on over here. You see the social organization. How many times have you talked about the Greek led organizations, uh, uh, Roland? And we just heard an example of it in real in in real life. And and so it's full spectrum. There isn't any tool we should leave in the toolbox. And you know, I, I, I'm reflecting on. Uh, the fact that you covered that DA race very extensively, and this shows the power of independent black media and advocate journalism. You're not you're not on the sidelines. In other words, this isn't something that you covered one or two times. You had the you had the campaign folk on. You had the, you were raising the issues, and and you kept hammering home the fact that politicians are there to do the job that they are elected to do. And I remember when. Um, I guess it was uh, our friend Melina Abdullah with Black Lives Matter LA was on. You know, one of the things that, uh, that the, the decision to go with Gesson was that they wrung out of him before they voted for him promises on what he would do. And then they went and hit the streets. I remember uh, Melina talking about the fact you had cats who were in these organized formations that we call gangs. And they simply said, do you all understand the role of the district attorney in your life? No, walk, walk us through it. And then not only after having been walked through it, did they get on board, they then turned around and started organizing people, some who had never had voted. So I, I think the trend now, even as we talk about these federal issues, finally, as we talk about these state level issues, the trend may very well be in this country as it begins to fracture at the national level to return to another emphasis on these local issues. And, and I don't think anything shows that in, in Los Angeles in particular, in California generally, than to see Congresswoman Bass say, I'm, I'm going to run for the mayor of Los Angeles. This is an intriguing moment we're in, and it just shows you the importance of black, black media, black news media, and black advocate journalists.
Uh, absolutely, yes. uh, folks. And when you talk about advocacy, we got to thank uh, the black folks of California uh, for uh, this particular next story. Remember, we had uh, the state senator from California on about uh, this black beach that was stolen from African-Americans in uh, 1912. Uh, well, California Governor Gavin Newsom has actually signed legislation returning this prime beachfront property called Bruce's Beach to the descendants of that particular couple. It was purchased in 1912 by Willa and Charles Bruce, who built the first West Coast resort for African-Americans. And segregation barred them from many beaches. Well, in 1929, the Manhattan Beach City Council seized the property by Emmett Domain, running these African-Americans off of that particular property. Now, as a result uh, of the work uh, of uh, black state legislators, uh, the transfer of that land to the descendants of uh, Willa and Charles Bruce must take place immediately as a result of Gavin Newsom signing this into law. That, uh, that there, are, there are cases all across this country, um, uh, Dr. Carr, where black land was stolen. How white supremacists use their legal authority, which was really illegal, in these in, with cities and crooked judges to steal the land, millions of acres of land of black people, and by stealing that land, depriving future generations of their inheritance. That's right, Ron. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, again, in that period of Reconstruction, when the Union Army got to South Carolina and that promise of 40 acres and a mule was made between 1862 and 63 and then betrayed when Andrew Johnson got in and allowed those former Confederates to come back down there and reclaim their land and the rest was sold to northern speculators, it was land. The betrayal of Reconstruction was the betrayal of land because land is the basis for wealth in this country. And, you know, it's no accident, as we see, and again, thinking about Ahmaud Arbery, thinking about Breonna Taylor, thinking about George Floyd and all the victims of patrol of violence in this country. It was really in the wake of their murders and the reckoning that began to unfold that we saw this long struggle catch fire. And so, it, it, again, like we're talking, you've got to get, get engaged and you got to fight to reclaim some certain uh, uh, certain uh, advance, and also extend that. Finally, Gar Gavin Newsom understands that his ass was saved in California by people who had to get together. So guess what? And save him. Look, Joe Biden, take note, man. Take note. Politicians not your friend. Gavin Newsom going to do what he's required to do when people require him to do it. This is the beginning, as you said, Roland. We'll probably see a lot more of these cases being pursued in the near future. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hill, again, we talk about that land and what, what they did here. Now there are efforts by others to say, hey, do the exact same thing that European Jews did when they were reclaiming stolen artifacts. They, to this day, they are still, to this day, they are still uh, chasing down artifacts that were stolen from Jews in Germany, uh, tracing that back and returning it to the rightful heirs. When it comes to the land, that same thing should happen. And one of the things that we should be pushing for, the creation of state commissions and groups to start examining if, it, uh, you know, if you have similar cases in Mississippi, in Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, all the places where black folks uh, lived uh, coming out of slavery during Reconstruction, as well as during uh, the Black Freedom Movement. Yes, uh, I would always ask my black studies class, who has land in your family? Ask your big mama now, or your G mama, whatever she's calling it now. Ask the elders <laughs> in your family about that land, because we all had land coming out of enslavement. Our people had land because they understood that land was valuable, land was wealthy. And so we have to teach our children, don't sell grandmama's house. Don't sell their property out, that's out in the country. Make sure that you pay the tax on it. Make sure that you take care of it, because it's wealth. I remember when uh, we came come, come out of northern Louisiana, and I remember when my mother and her siblings would get these little checks for $20 and $30 as a child. And I never understood what was going on, but then as I got older, I realized, well, uh, 
Papa Tobe had land and when he came out of slavery. He had 200-something acres, and we had to get it back from the people who, who stole it from us. I found a court document just recently when I was doing some family research. So it's important that we understand the value of land, and we teach our children and our grandchildren what that means to us and what it means for future generations. And all we got to do is dig. Somebody got some land somewhere. If you're in, in Texas, it's probably in east or west Texas, wherever you are, but somewhere south, we got some land. We need to reclaim it, definitely. Mm -hmm. Reese. Yeah, I mean, I think I love that you mentioned the commission. I think we've heard so much pushback about things like the HR 40 commission and, oh, we don't need another study. We don't need another commission. Yes, we do, because we might not get a $3 trillion check of reparations, but there can be um, some repair being done to things like the black farmers and all of the land that's been repossessed and confiscated from them through air through heirs property type of um, false claims and things like that. So there is a lot of ways that wealth has been extracted and stolen from black people, um, primarily through land and through the loss of land. And I think that resources are being put into tracing how those things were wrongfully taken and getting them back is one way of, of of, of repairing some of the damage that's been done economically. Um, and so I think it's important that we put resources behind it, whether it's legal resources to have these kind of court challenges and court cases. It's important that we put politicians in there who are going to do what they are supposed to do by our community, do right by them. And you have to give credit to Gavin Newsom where it's due because he also signed the, um, the Reparations Commission in California as well. And so we are headed in the right track with that, but there's still a long way to go. And it does start at the local level and it starts with putting the resources Sources behind, um, you know, fleshing out these claims. Uh, indeed, indeed. All right, folks, it's time for uh, our new segment, Black and Missing. At age 13, was last seen in Williamsburg, Virginia, on September 22nd, 2021. Uh, he is five feet six inches, 95 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a white hoodie jacket, black jeans, and blue shoes. He's a tattoo of the letters GBG on his right hand. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Dejan, please get in touch with the York County Sheriff's Office at 757-890-3621-897-3621. Uh, folks, some sad news. Earlier this week, we told you about uh, Aisha Gil Ashley Guillory, who was missing uh, in Houston uh, since September 4th. Well, her body was found in Fort Bend County, Texas. The skeletal remains were actually found. Uh, po police believe that Willie Brown, a longtime friend of Ashley's, killed her on September 5th in a hotel room uh, in Houston and then di disposed of her body in uh, the next county. Brown led authorities to Ashley's body and is charged with murdering the 31-year-old mother of three. Again, as I said, Brown is described as uh, a good friend uh, of Ashley. That, uh, folks, is really, really uh, is, is a very sad story. And so, uh, but again, we're going to have our Black and Missing segment every day uh, featuring an African-American who is missing. Don't get a lot of media coverage, but we're going to do our part to ensure that happens. All right, folks, our final story. Y'all know what time it is. No charcoal grills are allowed. I'm white. I got you, huh? Um, illegally selling water with our permit? On my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, remember, get me your ass. We don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. Well, you know, you got black folks walking their dogs and they traveling, just minding their own business, just being black. And then you always have a uh, dog park Debbie who decides to open her damn mouth. Well, this took place uh, in Brooklyn in the neighborhood uh, in Williamsburg, where uh, this white woman told a black couple uh, to stay in your neighborhood. Well, one of the people who she was harassing is the brother Frederick, uh, Frederick Joseph. Who is he? The author of the book, The Black Friend, on being a better white person. Now, the woman has not been identified, but her ass has been fired uh, by her company because uh, 
Guess what? Derek Anderson, the CEO of Bevy, believed to be her employer, took the swift action, apologizing to the couple, and then announced on Twitter yesterday an employee engaged in behavior contrary to our values and has been terminated. Uh, Reese, I keep saying every black person, when when one of these white folks get fired, we, 50 black people should be flooding that office with application, take their job. Hell yeah. And I, did you say Fred T. Joseph? <laughs> I mean, he's a pretty big influencer. So, you know, you, you fuck with the wrong one, Karen, okay? Because he actually has a platform. He was able to put your dumb ass on blast. Yeah, fire them all. Um, you know, I say... Well, let me not say that because this is a this is a new show. <laughs> but all I have to say is quit fucking <laughs> with black people. Who the hell? Maybe you need to go back to your neighborhood. How do we know that you belong in your neighborhood? How do we know you ain't from some trailer park somewhere? How you look at the black people walking their dog, minding their business, and determine that they don't belong where they are? Maybe you don't belong where you are. As a matter of fact, you definitely don't if you messing around and harassing black people. Now your ass is out of a job in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Y'all, here's the actual video. Watch this. <laughs> hood? No, 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 no. I invite everyone. Stay in our hood. Stay in our hood. That's what, I'm sorry, what? Excuse stay in our hood. Stay in our hood. You just told us. Stay in our hood. You just told us to leave the dog park and stay in our hood. Oh my God, did you just say that to me? Shit. Wow. Oh, that's funny. Wow. Wow. The Karen is in the white. There's, I'm sorry. You were right here. Watch this entire thing. Did she just not stand here and tell us to stay in our hood? She did. She just told you just told us to stay. Uh, all, all I ask, all I ask, Doctor Hill, when y'all record these videos, please, can you record <laughs> horizontal a landscape so we can see all of the racism? Uh, in the, yeah. on the screen. That way, we don't have we, we don't have to put we don't have to put a logo in the back, you know, versus the black bar. So uh, we need to see her big ass face. Uh, so please, y'all, please don't shoot videos this way. That's why you get the black bars on the side. You turn your phone this way, it'll fill a whole screen up. <laughs> Listen, Roland. Thank you. You know. Karen is just out of control, and we all know why. You know, she's scared, she mad, because she look up, and she ain't having no babies. Her population is shrinking. She <laughs> is becoming the minority. And she and Todd don't know what to do. It's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Well, you know, welcome to America. It's training. It's, it's, it's turning now. So, so you got to deal with it. And... I'm just waiting for Karen to come and approach me. She hasn't, you know, any, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And, you know, I was glad that the man was standing there. He said, yep, that's what she said. And this innocent, oh, my God, you're attacking me. Girl, please, you better go somewhere with all that. But, but you know what? You noticed for a second there, he did pause, like, there was part of him that was like, I'm a white man. I don't know if I want to get involved. But then he was like, yeah. this might go viral. I ain't trying to be that white man who sat up there and sided with the camera. So that he went on and said, uh, yeah, mm. she said that. Mm -hmm. right. But yeah, he, he exactly. hesitated. He hesitated. That's right. Uh, Greg, uh, I'm telling you, they, they, look, y'all keep acting the fool. You could, I just, just, just keep firing. Keep firing. That's why everybody just, y'all keep shooting. And your whole time, you keep going, you about to lose your job. You about to lose your job. And then, and like the fool yesterday at FedEx, if y'all want to be so racist and you actually want to shoot your own videos, I highly encourage you. You know what? If you're white supremacist and you want to shoot your own video, I'm okay if you shoot this direction. You can 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 shoot this direction. Shoot this direction. Just show your face so we can track your ass down. But wait, <laughs> yeah. after Dr. Carr, can we talk about Ellen Karen Pompeo? Because she told on herself, too. Oh. And Denzel. But go ahead, Hold Dr. on. Dr. Carr, have, hold on. Hold on. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, okay, I'm, I will extend the show for three more minutes. But Greg, <laughs> answer that, and then we'll talk about Ellen Pompeo. No, very quickly, uh, I would just say, you know, it feels good and it's important. At the same time, I mean, these these incidents are like thermometers. 
We're mm. in a country where white folk feel like they can say and do whatever the hell they want. She was genuinely shocked when they pushed back. Oh, what? You, what did you say to me? In other words, you know, every white person in America is a potential deputy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is this is the whole point. And so pushing back is important, although, you know, this can cut all kind of ways. What I don't want to see happen is black people start losing their jobs when, by when, when if this thing were to flip in another direction. But I mean, that that's neither here nor there. The only other thing I would say is, and I agree with you, Reese, I felt the same way. I said, the white boy kind of hesitated. Chapter mm -hmm. six in the brother's book is, so your friend is racist. What should you do? <laughs> Here's the point. <laughs> that white man made a choice. He had his beer in his hand. He tried to enjoy his uh, favorite beverage, and he was like, damn, what, what the hell? And in a split second, he came down on the side of the angels. But you're right, Reese. He hesitated for a minute. Mm -hmm. So we have to always be cognizant. Oh. White people, there's a choice to be made. Go read Brother Joseph's book, Chapter 6. So your friend is racist. What should you do? <laughs> you better be <laughs> yeah, back real quick. <laughs> All right, y'all. I'm going to add this one more. Roll it! Okay, I, I'm going to say this right now, and, and this applies to anybody who is white and anybody who is black. Sometimes it's some shit you don't need to say or admit to publicly. Mm. Well, y'all, Ellen Pompeo, the star well, Grey's Anatomy, she plays Meredith. Well, Ellen decided to share with everybody the story of how she put Denzel Washington in his place. Mm. Now, I need y'all to understand something. It didn't go well when Katie Couric brought up something that Denzel, how he supposedly treated her few years ago. They ain't go too well for Katie. Katie got, Katie was even high with me. She sent, sent me an email and wanted to mm. talk to me. I said, let's talk. She never hit. She never called me back. Mm. Uh, Katie, what's up? Oh, you got yeah. my number. I got your number. So, but that's fine. That's fine. That's neither here nor there. Well, Lil Ellen tells this story of when Denzel was directing an episode of Grey's Anatomy and she decided, she said that the other actor improvised, so she, she decided to improvise and then jumped on the actor, started telling him how he should be performing. And then Denzel said, hold up, you ain't the director? And she was like, "Who the, basically, who the hell are you? This is my show. She said, And she was like, Denzel came at. Fucker. That's what she said. Wait, 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 what? She said, listen, motherfucker, Quote, this is my show. She admitted to this, to Denzel Washington. Sorry, Roland, but you had to say that part. Right, right, <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, you know, I, I know you, you really wanted to say it. No, I right. know, I mean, I can say it, but I know you really, I know you really wanted to wow. say it. No, so right. she was like, yeah, yo, this, this, this mine. She actually decided to tell the story. Bl Black folks been lighting her ass up for the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, and, uh, it, it ain't, it ain't, um, uh, she probably gonna uh, come out with uh, an apology. Because uh, I, I just need y'all to understand you cannot talk trash about Jesus, <laughs> Dr. King, Aretha Franklin. That's right. Idris <laughs> and Denzel. Or Miss Patty. 
I'm just, I'm just saying, you can't. You can't. You cannot do that. It is not going to end well for you when you do that. <laughs> Ellen, keep some shit to yourself. <laughs> and when you drunk with your friends, share that story when nobody got a camera on. But yo, Reese, they been on home. And look, it don't and Ellen, just cause your husband black. Mm-mm. We don't care. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You can't. Mm-mm. You girl just uh mm -mm. Wait, when did, not Denzel. When did this happen, you? She she did shared it? the story no, yesterday. So no. here's a here's another oh. issue that I have with it because her whole point of this story was to put it out there that Denzel quote unquote went nuts on me, but then you proceed to tell us how you lost your crazy ass mind on the Denzel Washington and see that's the problem that I be having with white woman because the story get flipped. And in this case, you told us that you were already sitting up there lying. Denzel did not flip on you. We know good and damn well ain't no black man gonna flip on no white woman on set, especially not anybody of Denzel Washington's caliber. He know better than to get crazy with some white woman who was a star of the show. Now, you gotta admit she's a star of the show. But how in the hell did you say, listen, motherfucker, to Denzel Washington become Denzel Washington? In fact, in fact no, 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 no. This is, the, hold on. I I'm a quote. She said, "He was this. This is what she said. Denzel went ham on my ass. He was like, I'm the director. Don't you tell him what to do. And I was like, listen, motherfucker, this is my show. This is my set. Who are you telling? Like, you barely know what a bathroom is. And I have the utmost respect for him as an actor, as a director, as everything. But like, yo, we went at it one day. First of all, ain't your goddamn show. It was Shonda's show. Right. Ain't your damn set. It was Shonda's set. Dr. Hill... But I don't like, know yo. what's up with these white women thinking they can just say some stuff. Uh, so they giving Ellen the business. Mm. Mm. And you say that she got a melanin husband. Maybe she <laughs> yeah. believes yeah. that because she's getting some of that black stuff, mm -hmm. that she can say whatever she wants to say. Because there are women who believe that, well, I'm getting that, you know, black thing, so I can do this and this and this. No, you can't. No, you can't. So I'm wondering, what is Hubby saying? Did he say, girl, you messed up? Or, you know, did he say, Karen, it's okay, I'm here? You know. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that may have a lot to do with her attitude, hey. believing that, you know, she can say what right, she wants. Right, right. Let's look at the why of it. What is the psychological profile for her to feel that she can say that? And would she have said it if she wasn't getting that black stuff? I'm just saying. See, mm -hmm. see, Greg, Greg, th this is how the conversation should have went down. Uh, this is how the conversation should have went down when uh, Ellen came home. Okay. <laughs> Her husband should have been sitting at the dining room table with a cup of black coffee. <laughs> and he should have been sitting there waiting. And when she came home and said, hey, honey, how you doing? He should have said, sit your ass down. <laughs> he should have said, he should have said, now, baby, let, let, me, let, me, let, let, me say, let me explain something to you. Now, I love you. Mm. And you my wife. Mm. But your ass ain't going to have me going up against Denzel Washington <laughs> and all of Denzel's fans. <laughs> Now he can say, now look, now I know, I know you married to me being a black man, but it's some stuff you don't say to a other black man that you think you can say. Cause I'm just letting you know right now, you ain't got those privileges to say that nonsense. And then you're going to demean by saying he ain't even know where the bathroom is. 
No, boo, that ain't how this works. So I'm going to need you to walk that shit back because we clearly ain't going to ever be able to go back to the NAACP Image Awards. <laughs> uh, we ain't going to get invited to no black cookouts. Now, you done messed my shit up because I can't go nowhere black with your ass, because your ignorant ass decided to tell the story publicly about how you called Denzel Washington a motherfucker. Right. Are we clear, honey? <laughs> right. That's right. Now, go and cook me some grits. I'm sorry. Greg, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, but that's, that's interesting. I mean, I, I was bemused at first, and then, of course, I guess reading there from the article that you showed, when uh, his wife came on set, she repeated the story and said, I had to get after him. And so, you know, as a, as a theater major in undergrad, I understand the way that actors behave when it's just actors around. Because, again, this wasn't a closed set, and it wasn't just her and him. There were other people around. The fact that this story didn't get out may mean in that context it's just, you know, man, they talking crazy. And, and as you said, Denzel know how to move through the world, uh, like, like you said, Reese. That haven't been said. I was sitting here trying to substitute untouchable white icons for Denzel. And I'm wondering if Paulette Washington, who was an actress, had been on set and called Tom Hanks directing that a motherfucker, mm. uh, whether or not uh, mm. Tom Hanks would have responded. And then if Tom Hanks' wife would have, the actress would have come on set and repeated that. I'm wondering, I'm saying the license that people think they have with black people, that's, that's one thing. But I think all of that is speculation. Here's the issue she faces, and you just nailed it, of course. We, it's what we're talking about. Denzel Washington is an untouchable for us. So whereas in your little bubble of acting world, you think it's okay to use the salty language and back and forth, this ain't Isaiah Washington 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. This Denzel, which means even if it's a misunderstanding, you think it's a cute actor story, you're done. Now, I don't watch any of those shows anyway uh, that come came out of Shonda World because, you know, I just got my own... At some point, you got to draw a line in terms of minstrelsy, but as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but uh, but that having been said, this ain't Isaiah. And I know you think all black men are the same, including your husband and brother. Mm. You better sit her down and tell her that regardless of what happened, black folk draw the line. So she can't walk that back. There's no apology she can make. She already done said it, and she bragged about it. So there's really nothing she can do. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, uh, and uh, with regards to that uh, hypothetical you mentioned, uh, I'll send Pauletta a text and I'll ask her, I'll ask her if she <laughs> would do that. I'll let you know what she say about that, because uh, you know I already sent, you know I, you know I already sent her a text. Cause just so y'all know, see, sometimes, uh, see, I see when 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 you are smart journalist, um, you always uh, get to know uh, the wife. Uh, yes. cause see that way, uh, <laughs> that way it's like, look at here, I need to get somebody to call the wife. So that's why, that's why y'all understand, uh, part of my success is mamas and wives love Uncle Roro. <laughs> and mamas and wives tell their husbands and children what to do and what to watch. And so that's how <laughs> I roll. And so, Dr. Hill, I appreciate you being on the show. We're going to have you back. Reese, thanks a bunch. Greg, thanks a bunch. Y'all, if y'all want to support what we do, please join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support what we do. Uh, cash app, dollar sign, Thank RM you. Unfiltered. PayPal.me forward slash R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, and then you can also, of course, please download the Black Star Network app. We're trying to get to 50,000 downloads by December 31st. It's free, free sign up. I'm not charging you anything. Just please download it, tell a friend. Let's make this thing happen. And y'all so funny. Y'all on, on YouTube talking about rolling, stop flexing. Uh, talk about uh, you got Paulette's, Pauletta's number. I do. Don't hate. Congratulate. I might let you celebrate. All right, y'all. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow from Dallas, Texas. Rolling Martin Unfiltered. Black Star Network. We're from my first place Astros. If you don't like it, get the hell over it. Ha!